It is now time for question period. The Leader of the Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thanks, Speaker. I, you know, I just want to say off the top, this first question we had since the um, untimely passing of the Honourable Jim Flaherty, it just, I think, moves us all to see so many members wearing green today in support of Jim and our first thoughts and, and hearts, I know all members of the Assembly, are with the member from Whitby Ajax, or Whitby Oshawa, Christine Elliott, and her sons, their sons, Gail and John Quinn. Uh, my question uh, to the Acting uh, Premier. Acting Premier, um, we've seen taxes go up considerably under the Liberal government, and we've seen a significant reduction of economic activity. We've lost jobs, and our rate of growth is near the back of the pack in Canada. Uh, do you agree that there is a correlation between tax increases and job losses? Question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Before uh, addressing the leader's question on behalf of uh, the Liberal Caucus, the Government of Ontario, I too want to express our deepest condolences to uh, the Flaherty family, in particular, of course, our colleague, the member from Whitby, Oshawa. And also, I think, join with the thousands of Canadians we saw over the weekend thanking uh, Mr. Flaherty and, and, indeed, his family for his many, many years of uh, public service. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the question... In terms of the, uh, the question from the Leader of the Opposition, uh, Mr. Speaker, no, I don't agree, Mr. Speaker. I think that what we have seen is a, a Premier and a Minister of Finance who have come forward with a plan, a plan that will be further enunciated in, in a budget in several weeks' time, a plan which is balanced, Mr. Speaker, which uh, addresses the needs of more growth in the, this province. We've seen uh, us rebound since the recession, Mr. Speaker, and I think we are on good course. We have a Premier who uh, represents a safe pair of Hands, Mr. Speaker, Thank you. to make sure that uh, our, our province can. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, uh, must be a safe cracker because she's robbing the people. Back. Um, Remember what we thought. Stop. Thank you. Order. Well, speaker, I, I guess in 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 other words, I never for Renfrew is is correct. The only thing that's a, a safe bet about those hands is they're going to go back in the pockets of Ontario families and take more money out of our pocketbooks. Uh, look, I, I, it was disturbing to hear your answer. You, you seem to indicate that you think that there's no connection between increased taxes and, and job losses. I remind you of a very basic uh, rule of economics or common sense. You increase the price of something, you get less of it. You increase taxes, fewer products are sold. Less people will create jobs in the province of Ontario. Quite frankly, the McGinty Win Liberals are a textbook case of increased taxes, damaging economic activity. So I asked the Deputy Leader, will you now say no new tax increase? You're going to Thank focus you. on job creation instead. I actually Thank want lower you. taxes. Why do you want to increase? Dr. Coffey, please. please. Thank you. Uh, Acting Premier. Uh, Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, the fact is that the combined federal, provincial, corporate income tax rate in Ontario is lower than any U.S. state. In fact, it's lower than almost 10 percentage points by the next U.S. state. And the result is that we're creating jobs. We've created 460,000 net new jobs, all of them full time since the bottom of the recession. But let me talk about the uh, the member, the uh, leader of the official opposition, and his scheme that will kill jobs and drive down wages and weaken pensions and, frankly, cut billions from schools and hospitals. You know, so in the right to work states, and this is what will happen if this individual becomes premier. Right to work states make the average worker makes almost six thousand dollars a year Answer. in the other states, and compared to the median household income in states with right to work, is six thousand four hundred dollars less Thank in those states. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. The, uh, the member from Northumberland, the member from Prince Edward uh, Hastings. No, he, he didn't. I'm sorry. Tried to use just my ears. Come to order, please. Uh, final supplementary. You know, it's uh, I, I guess to the economic development minister now. Uh, you know, it's disturbing to hear you basically say you think taxes are too low in the province of Ontario. I, I think they're too high, and that's why my million jobs plan will actually lower taxes, have less debt, get energy rates under control. My plan 
is to create a million new middle class jobs in our province to give hope to young people again. The minister says that our, our uh, tax rate on businesses uh, is uh, among the lowest in North America, but, but minister, you, you conveniently either ignore or are not aware that income taxes are much higher in Ontario than the states or provinces that you mentioned. They certainly didn't bring the HST tax increase in the states that you mentioned. Uh, and let's not forget, you said that the HST tax increase would create 600,000 new jobs in the province of Ontario. Um, can, can the minister actually, will the minister stand by that? You, you said that like putting a new tax on, on gas for your car and your hydro bill would create 600,000 jobs. Can you report back exactly how many new jobs did your HST tax you. create in the province? You see that, please? You see that, please? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I think in the four or maybe five years since the HST was introduced, and that commitment was for 600, that estimate was 600,000 jobs over a 10 year period. We've already created 450,000 jobs since the bottom of the session since 2009. But let me talk, let me, you know, one of the things that concerns me the most, Mr. Speaker, quite frankly, about the job scheme that the member opposite, the leader of the official opposition, has his right to work for less. Because in those states where they have right to work, which is the direction that the member opposite wants to go in his attack on labour, the rate of workplace deaths is 36 per cent higher in states wow. with these laws, with these right to work laws, Mr. Speaker, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. We're not going that direction. We believe that it's a partnership between government, Answer. private sector, labour, and the representatives to continue to build jobs. We are building jobs in this province, right across the province, and will continue to do so. Question. Leader of the Opposition. Um, I I'll, guess I'll go back to the economic development uh, minister. Um, and, and again, I remind that your, your, job, your, your title is supposed to be about creating jobs in the province of Ontario, not Michigan or Wisconsin or, or Indiana. I don't know if you got that quite right yet. But, um, you, you know, uh, we, we had a revelation now from the minister who says that the 600,000 jobs they wanted to create through increasing the HST, that that was back end loaded. That that's to come in the last of the 10 years. So if we've lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs, you got 600 to come. I guess it's another 900,000 jobs that you're going to create in 2021. Minister, I remind you, I've got a million jobs planned to create jobs in the province of Ontario today to put people to work in the province now, not, not 10 years from now. I'll ask you this too, uh, Minister, because you did campaign on this. Question. You, you've increased the HST, you brought in an income tax increase, you brought a new health tax. Leader. Um, before I go to the Minister, uh, on both sides, even when the question is being put, I'm hearing people heckle from that side, and it's hard to discipline somebody on that side when somebody's heckling their own leader. And in this case, when somebody gives the answer, I don't want to hear any heckling. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I guess the leader of the official opposition didn't see the jobs created last year, last 95,000 last year. In fact, last month, 13,400 jobs were added, including Member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, come to order. People. But I'll say, the member from Stormont, come to order. But I'll say, Mr. Speaker, just today we're announcing two important investments by this government for job creation, and the member opposite is asking where. Well, in fact, they're in Tory ridings, and I suspect that the Conservatives that currently hold these ridings, Classic Coconut and Simcoe, which is a fantastic company there that are expanding their, uh, their work in that important jurisdiction as well, which is, of course, a Tory riding, and RBW Graphics and Owen Sound, another one, creating jobs. Just today we're making these two announcements. The member from here on Bruce, I mean, uh, Bruce, to create jobs. Bruce, Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, will Speaker, come to order the second the time. The opposition is getting his facts, but he's clearly not looking at the facts that are there for anybody to see. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, you know, again, here, here's a major difference. The minister thinks we need to bribe businesses to stay in Ontario. I want to create an environment where they're knocking down the doors to set up shop. With the I'm not going to accept that. Uh, please withdraw. Withdraw. Carry on, please. 
So you want to give businesses money to try to get them to stay. I want to actually lower taxes, get energy under control, less density, knock down the doors. The bill here in Ontario, that, that's my plan. I call it the million jobs plan. Now, I know that the Premier is making an announcement today that she wants to expand subways and she's going to increase taxes to pay for it. I, I think the last thing you want to do Minister is to increase taxes. Universities come to That's order. going to cause us to lose even more Question. jobs. You're at the back of the pack. We built 64 new subway stations. We didn't increase taxes because it grew the economy. Why are you going to increase taxes yet again? Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite talks about subways built, but I talk about the subway that you didn't build. In fact, it's in my riding, the Anglican subway in the 1990s. The hole was dug, the subway was ready to be built, and your government filled in that hole. But I want to talk about his job scheme, which what he, his idea of what he wants to replace here. And I'm not going to talk about my words. I'm actually going to quote in the Toronto Star. Hudak's plan is the collection of recycled ideas and dangerous policies that would kill jobs or drastically reduce wages and pensions. Or here in the Welland Tri Tribune as well, Grant LaFleche. Hudak's magical thinking, the member from Central magical North thinking come to is order. just insulting to our collective intelligence. Or we've got Don Answer. in the Globe and Mail. It's extremely unlikely to produce that many jobs. A few calculations should have made that evident, said economist Don Thank you. Drum, Drum. Final supplementary. You know, I, I know the minister calls it magical thinking. I call my plan an ambitious turnaround plan to put people back to work in our province. It's called the Million Jobs Plan. It will actually fire up our economy, give young people a chance to get their own home, to pay down the mortgage. I'm going to ask you again. We've heard this story now several times. I know you guys never use the words Dalton and McGuinty in the same sentence anymore, even though the Premier famously campaigned on Dalton, Dalton, Dalton. But it's the same playbook. Before an election campaign, you said there'd be no increases on middle class families, but after you brought in the health tax, you brought in an HST tax crowd, you brought in the eco tax. I could use up all the question period with your tax increases. It hurts our economy, it hurts young people and their aspirations in the province. I believe taxes need to come down to create jobs. Why are you going to increase taxes on hardworking families again? Just say no. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, of course, the Premier has already said that she's not going to increase the HST. She's not going to increase taxes for middle-income earners as well. But the Leader of the Opposition's plan would kill jobs. It would drive down wages. It would cut billions from our schools and our hospitals. And if, for quite frankly, if the Eglinton line that his party filled in, that hole that they filled in the 1990s, if it had to be completed, it, we wouldn't have— they, in fact, they spent $150 million, Mr. Speaker, filling in that hole. And then with the HST, the member opposite knows that he was against it until the election, and then he flip-flopped, and now he's in support of the HST changes that were made in this province. We're finding the progress made in creating jobs, 460,000 since the recession. We're the number one destination for foreign direct investment. We have the lowest corporate, uh, yeah. provincial, federal income tax rate in, in North America, Mr. Speaker. And so these, these yeah. improvements we're seeing, if the unemployment rate is coming down, there's much more work to be done, but we're on the right track. Thank you. New questions. The leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um on behalf of New Democrats, I would like to begin by extending our condolences to the member for uh, Whitby, Oshawa, uh, and their children on the passing of uh, Jim Flaherty, uh, the husband and father that he was uh, to, to that family. Uh, we also want to extend our condolences to the Conservative caucus, frankly, Mr. Speaker, who are, I'm sure, going through a difficult time uh, in not only the loss of Mr. Flaherty but the support of, of their member uh, from Whitby, Oshawa. We also want to join with Canadians uh, in noting Mr. Flaherty's uh, many years of dedicated public service, Speaker, as, uh, as we mourn his passing. Uh, speaker, my first question is to the Acting Premier. In the investigation into whether Liberal staff committed a criminal breach of trust, the OPP allege 
that the House Leader's Chief of Staff is one of many people who had their computer accessed and possibly wiped clean. Can the minister confirm whether this is the case? Thank you, Acting um, Mr. Speaker, I can do nothing of the sort. This is an OPP investigation, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very happy, Mr. Speaker. I'm a very patient person to go over the facts of the situation. Several weeks ago, Mr. Speaker, a document was released through the courts, which gave a, a, a glimpse of an ongoing investigation by the Ontario Provincial Police. And, Mr. Speaker, the tradition of this legislature, something that was confirmed by an OPP officer who appeared in front of the Justice Committee, is that politicians should stay out of OPP. OPP investigations, and Mr. Speaker, I will not be commenting on anything related to that investigation in the House or out there in a scrum with the press. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, for over two years, the minister has been tasked with stick handling key questions about the waste of over a billion dollars in gas question? plant scandals and criminal investigations into the possible disappearance of information. Police believe the minister's own chief of staff had her computer accessed. Now, is the minister claiming seriously that he has never spoken with her about this? You know, Mr. Speaker, I am I'm not sure where she's going with this question, but if we're going to start if we're going to start to get into drive-by smears against uh, uh, staffers here in the legislature, Mr. Speaker, because I think we all recognize, Mr. Speaker the important role that's played by our staff, the fact that they cannot defend themselves, Mr. Speaker. The fact of the matter is that the Ontario Provincial Police have indicated that there is one person that is uh, uh, of interest in terms of this uh, uh, potential charge, Mr. Speaker, which has not been uh, proven yet, and that is the former Chief member of Staff, from Renfrew, Mr. Come Speaker, to, order. to the former Premier. If the honourable member wants to uh, uh, start to go through the list of people that they've interviewed, as I've said, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, if you look at the court document, they list everyone from opposition MPPs to a whole range of current and former staff. And, Mr. Speaker, yes, I think sir. we should allow the Ontario Provincial Police to undertake their work. Thank you. Final supplementary. Uh, speaker, the question is actually to the minister, and it's about what the minister did or didn't speak to his staff about. It's not about the staff person specifically. Last week, the minister claimed not only that he knew nothing about the OPP investigation until it broke into the news, the minister of the he knew nothing about the investigation conducted by his own ministry speaker now he's claiming he knows nothing about what's happening in his own office does the minister think that that's credible speaker mr speaker uh, uh, again the fact that the ontario provincial police was looking into the matter has been a matter of public record for quite some time, Mr. Speaker. There have been numerous uh, uh, articles that have been written in the media and statements. I believe Commissioner Lewis even appeared in front of uh, the Justice Committee. The details of that that were released in a court document two weeks ago, Mr. Speaker, provided a glimpse into this investigation. As Minister, Mr. Speaker, I have uh, informed my Deputy Minister of the day that I did not want to be involved or informed as to what was going on in that OPP investigation because, quite frankly, Mr. Ontario. Speaker, that is the proper thing to do when you are a minister, and it is a proper thing to do when you are the leader of the third party or a member of this legislature, Mr. Speaker. Allow the Ontario Provincial Police yes, to undertake their work. As the officer uh, pointed out in committee, it could even jeopardize an investigation to have a po politician interfere. Well, Speaker, it's pretty rich that the Liberals. New question, sorry. Up. It's pretty uh, that it's the proper thing to do is something that they know. They don't know what the proper thing to do is. My question is for the acting premier, Speaker. The government says they've learned their lessons, frankly, uh, from the gas plant scandal. But last week, they confirmed that they're ready to cook up new, even riskier private power deals. Can the acting premier tell us how much of our hydro system the government's uh, prepared to sell? Acting premier. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, again, you know, what we are talking about, Mr. Speaker, is a decision to cancel two gas plants that was supported by every single party in this legislature, Mr. Speaker. And the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, that uh, our efforts have been to make sure that that sort of error never happens again, and our efforts have been to strengthen our power system here in the province of Ontario. I commend the Minister of Energy for the good work that he's done, Mr. Speaker, and I, I commend 
uh, members to look at the government's record, Mr. Speaker, which I would put up against the NDP's lack of a record or lack of uh, position when it comes to energy any day of the week. Member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek, will come to order. Sup uh, supplementary. Speaker, as the acting premier knows, the PC caucus is very gung ho on the same sort of sell-off. Yet here's what the Liberal Energy Minister at the time said about those plans just months ago, and I quote: "That's just a creeping approach by the Tories to get rid of the whole asset. We need to keep the whole asset in public hands, public control, working for families and businesses in the province of Ontario." Unquote. Now, is the acting premier saying they agree with the creeping approach of the Tories, or what with the with the uh, energy minister said. The minister, of training, the minister of training colleges and universities. Training colleges and universities. Speaker, the minister of energy's comments today are exactly the same as they were last week, and exactly the same as when the member quoted. The minister said last week to a similar question, maintaining public ownership in key assets will continue to be a priority. That's pretty clear, Mr. Speaker, of what our position is. But why the NDP would be opposed to taking a look at our assets and trying to find better ways to get value is beyond me. Isn't that what all of us should be doing, working together to try to do that? Get better value for taxpayers' investments and ratepayers' investments? Why would the NDP be opposed? To doing that, Mr. Speaker. They're so backwards in their philosophy, Mr. Speaker, they have no clue how to get better value for taxpayers. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, Ontario families are stuck paying some of the highest hydro bills in Canada, and they don't see solutions coming from this government, just the billion dollar tab for private power scandals and political games. This government's made it clear they won't merge agencies to tackle bloat. They won't put a hard cap on CEO salaries at twice the, premier, the Premier's pay. They won't do anything to stop exporting electricity at discount rates and sticking people with the bill. Their only plan is to pull a page from the PC white papers. Does the Acting Premier think that's good enough, Speaker? Yes, sir. Mr. Speaker, our commitment to low- and middle-income families has been proven through many years of hard work. You look at our Ontario Clean Energy Benefit, Mr. Speaker, 10 per cent off of uh, energy bills. You look at our Ontario Energy Property ta Tax Credit, Mr. Speaker, saving a maximum of over $1,000 for families across this province. You look at the Northern Ontario Energy Tax Credit, saving families $210 a year, Mr. Speaker. We've been there for low- and middle-income families when it comes to this. What they want to know is where are they going to get their power from under an NDP government, Mr. Speaker. They're against nuclear. They're against gas. They're against wind turbines. They're against hydro. They're against every form, Mr. Speaker, of energy provision in this province. Mr. Speaker, that's the question that ratepayers across this province ought to know. Where are we going to get the power yes, from if, God forbid, you ever became Premier? Thank you. No question. The, leader, the, the member from the team, Carlton. My question is to the Minister of Government Services. As the minister who is constitutionally responsible for the uh, public service IT department, he has stood here in this place and defended a senior bureaucrat offering a super password to allegedly wipe out 24 hard drives in the Premier's office and access to 24 of those computers, which contain sensitive cabinet information to an outsider with no uh, security or, or background check. The role of the Minister of Government Services is not to defend the alleged destruction of documents in order to avoid avoid public scrutiny. We are in the midst of a $1.1 billion gas plant scandal that saved five seats in the last election. The hard drives, documents and emails in question relate to that scandal, to an obstructed Information Privacy Commissioner report and an OPP investigation. Given that I said that the minister is the constitutionally responsible minister, doesn't he think it's time that he accepts responsibility for the destruction of those emails? Thank you. You see that, please? Thank you. Minister of Government Services. You know, Mr. Speaker, I know I know the honourable members having some fun here playing a police officer, and she's trying to she's trying to turn she's trying to turn, Mr. Speaker, this chamber into some kind of law and order paper. But the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, that there is an issue in front of the Ontario Provincial Police. 
There is a document that went before the court, Mr. Speaker, which outlines some allegations, which outlines, gives us a glimpse into where we are in terms of an investigation, Mr. Speaker. There is nothing in that document that is, that is proven, Mr. Speaker. It is now up to the OPP to finish their work, to draw conclusions, and then, if necessary, take the next steps. And, Mr. Speaker, the advice that we received from the OPP in front of the Justice yes, Committee is that the prudent course for all of us, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, is not to play amateur detective. It is to stand back, Mr. Speaker, and allow the Ontario Provincial Thank Police you. to undertake their work. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister seems to be very fixated on law and order, but from here it looks like we're watching The Sopranos because that's how they're running their government. The minister has had an opportunity to launch an internal investigation into the high-level access given by David Nichol to Peter Faist, and he didn't. He had the opportunity to recover the deleted emails from servers in this billion-dollar scandal, and he didn't. He had the opportunity to remove the rogue bureaucrat from heading up the IT department just two weeks ago, and he didn't. Instead, he stands by here day in and day out, refusing to accept and acknowledge the fact he served in Dalton McGuinty's cabinet and that holding this government to account is somehow an affront to democracy. And Of course, he stands here expecting anyone in this province to believe that Premier Wynne is actually uh, without repute in all of this. We know, Speaker, that not the case. This minister, his premier, and that government have been neglect negligent in protecting the public interest time and time again. Thank you. Will he own up? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, there is absolutely nothing wrong with the opposition holding the government to account. All we ask, Mr. Speaker, is that they use facts. Exactly. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, is there is a document that was tabled with the court, Mr. Speaker, and that document talks about one individual, the former chief of staff to the former premier, Mr. Speaker, and actions that may or may not have taken under his watch. These are unproven allegations, Mr. Speaker. And what we are asking is two things. We are, first of all, asking that members stand back and allow the OPP to undertake their work, and we are also asking for the opposition, Mr. Speaker to deal with facts. And that member of all who understands about bluedraft.com and the fact that she had to issue an apology, Mr. Speaker, when she didn't deal with facts should know very well the dangerous, Answer. dangerous territory that she and her colleagues are getting involved with. Thank you. New question, a member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Acting Premier. The Acting Premier claims that when he learned of an internal government investigation into the deletion of gas plant emails and wiping computers in the Premier's office, he didn't want to know anything about it. It's also through the Acting Premier we learned the Liberal Party did an internal investigation that led to the firing of Peter Feist. Are there any other internal investigations being kept secret from Ontarians? Oh. Acting Premier. Mr. Speaker, again, I would direct uh, members to the document that was tabled with the court. It is now a, a public document, Mr. Speaker, where it outlines a number of activities that were undertaken by the Ontario Provincial Police, including, Mr. Speaker, about the cooperation that it received from the Ministry of Government Services. As I stated in the legislature, I believe it was last week, Mr. Speaker, I was approached in a general way by my deputy minister, who said that uh, it was now a matter of public record at that point that the OPP was looking into this matter and that they had had some contact with my ministry. Did I want to know any details of it, Mr. Speaker? And I said that that would not be the prudent course, Mr. Speaker, that I would allow the OPP to Answer. undertake their work, and I did not want to be briefed on it. And Mr. Speaker, I give the same message to the member from uh, Toronto, Danforth. Let us allow the OPP to undertake their work. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, as is clear, I was not asking about the OPP investigation, but the Liberal investigation. The government has told Ontarians that the Liberal Party conducted an internal investigation that led to Peter Feist being fired. But they won't say what they were investigating or what they found. Ontarians have learned that the Ministry of Government Services conducted an internal forensic investigation into the wiping of the computers in the Premier's office. But they are keeping the report secret. Is the acting premier still going to insist that the government is open and transparent? Wow. 
Mr. Speaker, I will make no apologies by the fact that we are cooperating with the Ontario the Provincial Police. Question. And the fact of the matter, Mr. Speaker, is I'm not sure where the NDP are going with these questions, Mr. Speaker, because it seems to me that the member from Toronto, Danforth, is asking us to interfere into an OPP investigation. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm getting a little bit uh, troubled by the fact that we have the progressive Conservatives on the one hand telling us that we're not doing enough. And uh, on the other hand, we have the NDP who are asking us that uh, uh, we're saying that too much is being done, Mr. Speaker. Let us allow the Ontario Provincial Police to undertake their work, Mr. Speaker, to respect that process and allow them to reach their own conclusions. Thank you. New question. The member from Scarborough, Gilbert. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Last week, I, along with my colleagues from Vaughan, Scarborough Asian Court and Mississauga East Cooksville, were at the Standing Committee for Finance and Economic Affairs, where we heard public deputations on Bill 20. We heard opinions and complaints about the Ontario Municipal Board and the role it plays in land use planning. And we heard from city councillors in Toronto, such as Adam Vaughan and Kristen Wong Tam who suggested Toronto is constantly at the Ontario Municipal Board fighting against development plans for important planning decisions. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can the Minister explain to this House whether the government believes that Bill 20 will adequately address these concerns? Thank you, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much, and I want to I want to thank the member for the question. I I also want to thank the members of our Toronto Caucus who, uh, in my short time in this ministry, have come to me with their interest in this particular issue. Big issue. Speaker, there has been suggestion that developers always win and that Toronto was always in front of the OMB. But the chief planner for the city of Toronto, Jennifer Kiesmat, doesn't agree. She has said a couple of things that I think are worth noting. Very important. One, she doesn't agree that they're always there. Contrary <laughs> to what some might believe, the city is not beholden to the OMB. She also also goes on to say the following speaker that only 4% of applications even end up at the OMB with the city winning about 50% of the appeals that do go to the OMB we do know speaker that at some point not all decisions that are made at the council level would necessarily be viewed as good planning and we on this side of the house do in fact believe that we need some appeal mechanism the truth is on bill 20 it does not force or legislate Answer. if it were to pass any appeals mechanism we believe one is necessary and i can speak more to that in the supplementary thank you the supplementary thank you speaker and thank you minister i'm glad that our government will shortly be introducing changes to the land use planning system that would strengthen community involvement, here, but here. I know many of my constituents work in our construction and building industries, and they are worried about the proposed changes in this bill. They're worried that these proposed changes could put their jobs on the line, and even community groups are worried what removing the Ontario Municipal Board will mean for their communities. In fact, Kent McKeskill, the president of the Friends of the Glen Davis Ravine from the Riding of Beaches East York, has said, without some sort of intermediary between residents and developers, it would be the wild, wild exactly. west. Exactly. I know that many local groups are concerned about having their voices heard. Oh, Speaker, through you to the minister, will the minister please explain what would happen if Bill 20 was to become law? Exactly. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, again, thank the member. member for the question. I do want to start by saying that in relatively short order, we will be coming forward with a package of reforms on land use planning and OMB reform more specifically, uh, hopefully in the not too uh, distant future, uh, based primarily upon the work that was done by uh, former Minister Linda Jeffrey, and I want to thank her for her efforts in that regard. Speaker, fundamentally, the problem is that Bill 20 will Remember not set Trinity's up Spadina. an appeals body, and by default, it will be transferring people's concerns from the OMB to the courts. We don't understand on this side of the House how in any way that makes access to land use reform planning appeal systems any better for anybody. The other part that's like significantly a problem with this is, should that bill pass, there is no transition period. Uh, Immediately upon its passage, should that have happened, uh, OMB would be gone. There would be no transition period should the City of Toronto wish yes, to set up an appeals body to get anything done. Transferring people to the court system is not a good way to deal no, with that. I, I don't know any judges that are planners, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. This member from Halliburton, Corth Lakes, Brock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. For weeks now, we've been asking you specific questions about the deletion of emails in the Premier's office. We've asked you what you knew about the email destruction and when. In response, you repeat the same talking points about cooperating with the police investigation, and then you've brought in new rules and procedures for documentation retention. 
the Archives and Record Keeping Act was passed in 2006. Yep. So, in other words, it was in place in 2011 when Liberal staff and the Premier's office were routinely oh, yeah. deleting their records at the end of the day. If Liberals followed the rules that were in place in 2011, we wouldn't be having this discussion here today. So, tell me, Acting Premier, what good is bringing in new rules and procedures when it's the same Liberal gang in place? Right. Yeah. Thank you. I think the uh, member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, second time. Actually, third, but I'll give you a pass. Here we go. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, through you, I ask the honourable members: since when is cooperating with the Ontario Provincial Police and not interfering? In an investigation, Mr. Speaker, talking points. Is this, Mr. Speaker, is this, Mr. Speaker, what, what Ontarians can expect from the opposition should they ever form government, Mr. Speaker, that they will freely interfere in an OPP investigation? Mr. Speaker, this is serious business. As to the second part of the question, Mr. Speaker, we are all aware of the report that came out from the Information and Privacy Commissioner, and we should also be all aware, Mr. Speaker, that that we took non-legislative steps Answer. to ensure that we were complying, Mr. Speaker, with the act that she cited. And at the same time, we have legislation before this legislature, which would in fact Thank strengthen you. that legislation. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, they're the government that put the rule in in 2006. You didn't follow it, your government. No. And the OPP, you're the party that's being investigated by the OPP. Yeah. Yeah. So you might have had some credibility if you'd made an effort to uh, find the guilty parties and bring them to justice, but you didn't do that. You've been claiming a conspiracy of silence has existed in your office since the day McGinty handed the keys to Kathleen Wynne, but the Justice Committee has established repeatedly that high-level, senior Liberal staffers knew that gas plant information on hard drives was illegally erased. Either this Premier didn't know her, no, and her staff deliberately misled her, or she knew and hasn't been upfront with the people of Ontario. When can the hardworking people of Ontario expect you to finally come clean about what you knew and stop making a mockery out of the office of the Premier? On this side of the House, we're not prepared to make a mockery of an Ontario Provincial Police investigation. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, we allow the police to undertake their work. But let me quote, Mr. Speaker, from the Information and Privacy Commissioner, Dr. Ann Kavukian, about the action that's been taken by our government. August 21st, Mr. Speaker, she had this to say about the Premier. She has been fully cooperative with me and my office. In fairness to Premier Wynne, she said you have my full cooperation, whatever you want from us. July 26th, I think on a go-forward basis. The government really is looking to change things. The government is dedicated to opening up access to government data. On June 13th of last year, I have commended Premier Kathleen Wynne's government's approach to dealing with this issue, referencing the staff training program she instituted and the memo circulated by her chief of staff June 25, 2013. Answer. I'm pleased now to report that the new government has acted proactively to address the recommendations made in my report. Mr. Thank Speaker, you. we have taken the necessary steps. Thank you. New question, the member from Trinity East Mr. Speaker, to the acting premier, Ontarians want transit that works, but they look back on the Liberal record and can only see years of waste, delay, and mismanagement. Wow. Presto, costs have soared by 450 million dollars. The government wants to run dirty diesel trains through our neighbourhoods instead of clean electric trains. Come to order. Uh, that's not helpful when I'm trying to get attention for your member, along with the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, who always likes to inject. Finish, please. Metrolinx and the Minister of Transportation have cancelled more transit projects than they have completed, putting short-term politics ahead of the public interest. Scarborough transit plans are in chaos. How can the government expect Question. the public to trust it with more money for transit when it has mismanaged this important file so badly? 
Uh, thank you, Premier. Are the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities, Mr. Speaker? The Minister of Training Colleges and Universities? Mr. Speaker, we're the only party in this legislature that's been there for transit from day one. Mr. Speaker, we put $19 billion into transit, and I can almost guarantee you every one of those dollars you and your party opposed. Mr. Speaker, what, and the NDP scoffs at our, uh, our multi-billion dollar investments. I think what we need to do is ask, what are you going to build, Mr. Speaker? When are you going to build it? And how are you going to fund it? Because over the last 10 years, you've said nothing about any of those things with regard to building strong public transit in the GTA and across this country. Supplementary. Four years ago, the current Premier cut $4 billion in transit funding, saying, and I quote her, we need to slow down the cash flow, end of quote. It was the current Premier who helped kill Transit City because she and the former— Carry on, please. It was the current Premier who helped kill Transit City because she and the former Premier Delta McGuinty were afraid to say no to Rob Ford. And it's the current Premier who is using our desperate need for transit to shift more, even more of Ontario's tax burden away from corporations and wealthy Ontarians and on to everyone Minister else. And instead to order. of dealing with these problems, Press the 10. government has wasted time attacking others. Does the government understand that it's time to stop attacking others and start fixing the problems it has created with transit? Thank you. Minister Training College University. Mr. Speaker, we're not attacking others. We're building transit. That's what we're doing. But we will attack those, Mr. Speaker, who make light of the investments that we're making. Absolutely. Mr. Speaker, I mean, think about this. We put in we put in funding, Mr. Speaker, to build the York Line. Mr. Speaker, the NDP opposed that. We're, we're funding, Mr. Speaker, the Air Rank Line. The NDP are opposing that. Mr. Speaker, we're finally building a subway to the Scarborough City Centre, Mr. Speaker, after people like from Scarborough have been looking for that for 30 years. Who's standing in the way of that, Mr. Speaker? The NDP. Mr. Speaker, we're going to build transit. We're going to keep on building transit. We're going to fund it. Unlike the NDP, who have no plan whatsoever, we're going to get it done. This Premier is going to get it done. And I'm looking forward to the budget, Thank Mr. Sir. Speaker, because that's going to elaborate on that even further. Thank you. Good question. The member from Scarborough Agents Work. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Newcomers from across around the world choose Ontario, more specifically my riding of Scarborough Agent Court, because we have access to some of the best public education in the world. Absolutely. Also, some of the best opportunity here, here. to build career and culture that promotes economic and social values of diversity. Our government recognized that when newcomers in Scarborough Asian Court arrived, they will benefit from classes, English or uh, French language classes. Specifically, specialized language training programs help newcomers learn the language specific to their occupation and help them become more employable. Speaker, when newcomers are successful in entering Ontario labour force, it benefits all of us. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please share with us how the ministry facilitated the delivery of these ESL services? Services to add on newcomers across Ontario. Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank the member for the important question. Mr. Speaker, all 72 school boards are eligible to deliver adult English and French as a second language programs here in our province. Adult ESL and FSL funding is provided to Ontario school boards based on enrollment numbers and demand in the area. And our government has invested $67 million this year so 120,000 learners can learn in our schools. Participants can learn and improve their English and French classes at their personal levels from beginners to advanced levels as well. Participants enroll in language training with a wide variety of goals in mind, including improving their language skills for daily life for the labour market and to pursue higher education. Mr. Speaker, providing accessible, publicly funded adult ESL and FSL courses is part of our government's commitment to improve the lives of newcomers because we know when newcomers succeed, Answer. Ontario succeeds. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that information on the government's commitment to adult ESL education. Attaining Canadian citizenship is one of the highest honours for many of the Ontario's newcomers. I encourage everyone to attend the Canadian citizenship ceremony 
in their lives to fully appreciate Great how ceremony. important citizenship is to a newcomer. As an immigrant, Mr. Speaker, I know becoming a citizen is a privilege and one that many newcomers consider one of their ultimate goals upon arriving to this country. Here, here. Recently, I learned that the Citizenship and Immigration Canada now accepts Ontario's ESL, FSL language training certificates as a proof oh, of great. language proficiency in citizenship Step application. Forward. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please tell us what this means for Ontario's newcomers question. and what role our government has bring in in this initiative That's forward? That's a great question. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I'd like to thank the member for the question. We've been working with the federal government in a collaborative way to make sure that we can get uh, certificates, our certificates here in the province of Ontario recognized when people apply for their citizenship here in the province of Ontario. Until now, only those who were linked programs received a certificate demonstrating their language proficiency for citizenship purposes. We're pleased to see that the federal government has finally listened to the province of Ontario and they'll allow for people who earn their certificates through our courses here in the province of Ontario when they apply for their citizenship. This is a huge step for Ontario and it's great for our newcomers here in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, because we want our newcomers to be successful. Thank you so much. Yep. New question. Member from Good morning, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Government Services. We have said all along that the uh, deletion, destruction and denials would be a bigger scandal than the $1.1 billion gas plant cancellation. It goes to expose the very DNA of the Liberal Party. You went to great pains to block us from getting any evidence from ever coming forward. You deliver some documents, we fought for more. You deleted emails, we got them restored. You destroyed emails, we brought in the OPP. You've gone to great lengths to stop us from ever getting to the truth, and now we know why. We learn of the widespread destruction of documents in the very office of the Liberal Premier. You stand there and read lots of notes to us, Minister. Why not read us a note of what was in those deleted emails? Yeah, Brick Nichols, Not surprisingly, I disagree entirely with the characterization that's been put forth by uh, the opposition critic. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, under this Premier's watch, we brought in the uh, Justice Committee. We gave it extraordinary powers, Mr. Speaker. And if he wants to hear, if he wants to hear some of the stats, we have provided 311,000. 325 pages to the committee. Wow. We've responded to 35 motions. The committee has heard from 77 witnesses and had 117 hours of testimony. Mr. Speaker, there has been one gap, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in terms of the committee's hearings, and that is that when we asked the progressive conservative candidates to come forward from that area to talk about why they made the exact same commitment, Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is that the Answer. conservatives blocked them and would not, Mr. Speaker, encourage them to come forward. So we are still, Mr. Speaker, anxious to hear Thank from you. them from their analysis and their uh, policy work. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Government Services. Delete, destroy, deny. That's your new motto. That's the motto. You had a chance to come clean with Ontarians, and you chose to delete documents. You had a chance to come clean with the gas plant scandal committee. You destroyed emails. You had a chance to come clean with the OPP. You deny any knowledge. These emails didn't just delete themselves. They didn't just destroy themselves. And now you sit there and deny any knowledge. You spent $1.1 billion to save Liberal seats, and you simply laugh it off. Well, Ontarians aren't laughing. They have the same question I have. As Minister, what else is it that you're hiding? Deny. Mr. Speaker, this was the party whose leader of the opposition went on YouTube and said the only way to get rid of the gas plant in Mississauga was for him to become Premier. This was the party whose candidates went out and sent out robocalls and tweets and press releases saying the only way to get rid of these gas plants was to elect a progressive Conservative government. Mr. Speaker, I direct the honourable member to the document that was tabled with the court by the OPP, which states, Mr. Speaker, that despite the fact the progressive Conservative and New Democrats made the exact same promise. They actually criticized our government for going through with it. As I've said many times, Mr. Speaker, it was a promise they made, a promise we kept. 
Excuse me, question. The member from Bramley, Gore Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Mr. Speaker, the Premier is stuck by her claim that she knew nothing about the allegations of computer wiping that took place between February 6 and March 20, 2013. But after becoming the leader of the Liberal Party, the Premier enlisted the aid of an entire transition team. Will the Acting Premier tell Ontarians when the transition team learned that the widespread deletion of emails and wiping of computers occurred in the Premier's office? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I think I'm, I'm, I'm tasked with the job of being Acting Premier because I'm a very patient person, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very, very happy, Mr. Speaker, to uh, outline the situation that we find ourselves in. Two weeks ago, Mr. Speaker, a document was made public by the courts. It was a document produced by the Ontario Provincial Police, which gives us glimpses into an ongoing investigation by the Ontario Provincial Police. Mr. Speaker, as we have been cautioned by OPP representatives of the Justice Committee, the best thing for politicians to do with an OPP investigation is to stand back, Mr. Speaker, and to allow them to do their work, to not come on it, comment on it, Mr. Speaker, to not try to play amateur detective, to not try, as I said earlier, to turn this place into law and order paper, Mr. Speaker, but allow the police to undertake yes, their work. That is what we are doing on this side of the House, and I would encourage the honourable member to follow suit. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to remind the acting premier that my question did not involve the OPP whatsoever. It's about this government's investigation and what this government knew. The premier has insisted that the current Liberal staffers, whose computers were wiped, have never spoken about this, including the three who work in the premier's office, a claim that a lot of people find pretty hard to believe. Will the acting premier tell Ontarians when senior Premier's office staff learned that current staffers in their office had their computers wiped. Mr. Speaker, my, uh, my patience knows no bounds. I will go back to the beginning, Mr. Speaker. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, it has been a matter of public record, I believe, since roughly last June, Mr. Speaker, that the Ontario Provincial Police have been looking into this issue in a, in a broad way. That is what has been a matter of public record. We've even had Commissioner Lewis appear in front of the Justice Committee. About two weeks ago, Mr. Speaker, we learned two things. Actually, we learned several things, Mr. Speaker. We got a glimpse into the OPP investigation. We found out that it was ongoing, meaning politicians should not be commenting on it or speculating on it. And we also learned, Mr. Justice Speaker, Clinton's that it was focused on one individual, the former chief of staff to the former premier. None of the allegations have been proven, Mr. Speaker. We are talking about a very serious situation. We have people's reputations on the line. Let us allow the Ontario yes, Provincial Police to undertake their work. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Training in Colleges and Universities. Etobicoke North know well post-secondary education is crucial to a prosperous economic future. Many of the families that I speak with tell me that their children in high school are faced with tough decisions upon graduation. Students at the end of their high school careers, for example, must decide to attend either college or university. Some students worry that if they attend a college but later decide to attend a university, transferring credits can be difficult. I also know that students face transfer credit challenges even when they move within the same university system to different divisions. And I use this opportunity, Minister, to once again welcome the 55 future doctors, medical students from all across Ontario of the Ontario Medical Association. Question. Speaker, my question is this. Can the minister please inform this chamber what are we as a government doing to assist these students? Thank you, Minister of Training, College, Universities. Mr. Excellent Speaker, question. that's a that is an excellent question. It's an important one, Mr. Yeah, Speaker, for students across this province. I mean, how many of us in this legislature actually ended up going into the profession that we started out in in our first year of college or university? Very few, Mr. Speaker. Them. Students do change their minds, and this fast-changing economy that we have, students are often forced to change their minds to be able to adjust to the changes in the economy. 
economy. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm really pleased that in January we announced the creation of a new course-to-course -course online guide and interactive database that lets students see how their credits are recognized at other institutions in order for them to be able to make informed decisions about the future of their education. Students can access this database through ontransfer.ca, a website designed to give more student flexibility and give them more choice in post-secondary studies. Answer. Mr. Speaker, this is going to be really helpful to students across this province. It moves us from a province that was, I would say, in the middle of the road to one now a lead that's you. a leader in credit transfers. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Minister. I appreciate the, the update. Uh, I believe that the steps, of course, are important and that we must ease transfer uh, movements within the post-secondary system, particularly within the same university system. But as you've rightly cited, with an ever-changing global environment, business climate, and market economy, Students must be empowered and be enabled to change the career paths should they choose. Speakers, you'll appreciate more and more of that educational access occurs on web-based learning platforms. Yet students also face barriers when trying to learn online. Many institutions across the province do not in fact recognize the courses that are available online making it often difficult for students with unique circumstances to complete their degrees. So I ask you, Speaker, through you to the minister, can the minister please explain what steps are being taken to bring parity between classroom and online Question. learning experiences? Thank you. Merci, Monsieur. Minister. It's another excellent question, Mr. Speaker. Yes. The fact of the matter is, Ontario is a leader. Some of our institutions are global leaders when it comes to online learning. But, Mr. Speaker, not all of them are. So some students in this province don't have access to the globally competitive quality online learning that they need to have access to. That's why, Mr. Speaker, in January we announced Ontario Online, an online centre of excellence designed to enhance learning experience and provide greater access to our students for online learning experiences. Mr. Speaker, Ontario Online will offer students the flexibility to learn wherever and whenever work, it, it works best for them. High-quality learning experiences from new courses that use only the best online learning technology and world-class instruction, because that's what our students deserve. Answer. This will provide comprehensive 24-7 online supports. Mr. Speaker, we've moved again from a province that was a leader, but not the leader in North America, to a province that I believe soon will be the yeah. leader in that's online fantastic. learning. That's what it Thank you. Question, the member from well, thanks very much, sir, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. I'm proud of how Eastern Ontario has rallied since the University of Guelph announced it was shutting down the Kempville campus. Shameful. Our community has made very positive steps already to ensure that agricultural and technological education continues in Kempville, but from the start, I've said it's critical to have an intake of new ag students in September. Hear, hear. Yesterday on Provincial Wide Radio, the Premier said, and I quote, I am hopeful that Brad and I will have an announcement soon. As well, a good solid statement about getting a first-year class in for the fall 2014 semester, unquote. Minister, students are making those important decisions right now regarding education in the fall. Can you confirm today that a first-year class will be attending Kempville campus in September, and when are you going to tell us how this will all work? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member opposite and the member from Glengarry Prescott, Russell, who I know have been working very hard and very closely with us on this issue. Both of them have. And Mr. Speaker, I, and I know the local community uh, through a number of different uh, individuals, from the mayor to to the group that's been set up to try to find local solutions to help, have been doing a magnificent job as well. Mr. Speaker, the Premier has given me my marching orders on this, and that's to ensure we find a solution. And the members uh, got his finger on a very important part of that solution, and that's ensuring, Mr. Speaker, that the uh, September cohort uh, proceeds uh, so that students in eastern Ontario and others that want to access Kempville campus, Mr. Speaker, have that opportunity. So we're working very hard with our post secondary partners, and I'm Answer. hoping very soon we'll have some good news, but we're not quite there yet. We're working hard at Thank it, you. and I'll let the member know as soon as there's something Thank more to you. be said. Back to, back to the minister, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the other critical factor in continuing the 97-year tradition of agriculture excellence at Kempville is maintaining the assets. I was pleased the Dairy Farmers of Ontario responded positively to requests from myself and others to defer any decisions about moving the quota allotted to the Dairy Education Order. and Innovation Centre. 
Dairy is a $1.6 billion industry that sustains over 20,000 jobs in eastern Ontario, so it's obvious that we have to maintain that program in our region. But quota is only part of what makes that dairy uh, program operate. We need the equipment and the herd, too. Minister, DFO has stepped up. What is your ministry doing to ensure the other assets, including those our community raised funds to purchase, stay right in Question. Thank you. Minister. Speaker, I and the member from Glengarry Prescott Russell and the member from Leeds, uh, Leeds Grenfell and the, and the mayor of Kempville, among others, had the opportunity to tour the Kempville campus a number of weeks ago. And I got to tell you, I was impressed. I believe it's 800 acres of land there, Mr. Speaker. I, I believe there's about 70 buildings there. Uh, some are in good shape, some are in not so good shape. I think this is a gem of an asset that has incredible potential, Mr. Speaker. We've got to work on the short term solution, as the member said, to, uh, to ensure that as of September, there's a cohort of students that can gain access to post-secondary education at that location, and that's what we're, we're working towards on the short term. On the long term, uh, Mr. Speaker, there's plenty of work to be done with the local community, with the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, with dairy farmers and others, as well as the local members, Answer. Mr. Speaker, to develop a vision for a long-term sustainability of that campus. That's what we're out to do, thank Mr. You. Speaker, and I thank the member for thank the question. You. Is Stop the clock for a minute, please. Let, let's get the member from Northumberland under control. New question, the member from Timmins, James Bay. We know that uh, the questions to the Deputy Premier, we know that the Ontario Energy Board approved an application to Union Gas for a 28% increase. Can you tell me why your government is standing on the sidelines while the OEB rubber stamps these huge rate increases? Thank you. The Minister of Training Colleges and Universities, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Training College and Universities. Busy morning, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it's an important question. At the same time, one would think the NDP would understand the role of the Ontario Energy Board, Mr. Speaker. Their role, Mr. Speaker, is to receive input in terms of applications to, in to uh, whether to increase or decrease natural gas. And the member knows, Mr. Speaker, over the last 10 years, we've seen natural gas decreasing on a steady basis. Of late, Mr. Speaker, do many would say because of the weather, there has been a spike, and the Ontario Energy Board is doing the work that they do, Mr. Yes, Speaker. They're independent of the government. They're independent of this legislature. One would think the member would not want us to interfere in this independent uh, hearing, Mr. Speaker, and uh, certainly it's not our intention to interfere as much Thank as you. we do recognize the challenges that ratepayers and uh, users are, are facing. Supplementary. Minister, if you're not going to stand up for the average person who can't afford these rate increases, who else? That's my question. The reality is, is that we see coming down the pipe a 44 percent increase on hydro cost as a result of what it is that you guys have put forward, and now we see Union Gas and others coming to you and saying, we need to have a rate increase. What people back home are saying, if this is all about what happened this winter, why is this rate, uh, this rate increase permanent? People cannot afford to pay, and they expect to see their government being there to assist them and not to stand on the sidelines. So I say again, will you take action as the minister and stand with the people of Ontario and not necessarily just those gas companies? Thank you, minister. Speaker, it must be nice to have the magic wand that the NDP have to, to control the, uh, the cost of natural gas in the, in the uh, continent of North America, but Mr. Speaker. That's not something that is within our control or yours. We have stepped up, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to being sensitive to energy costs for families. The member scoffs, but he scoffs because he didn't support this, Mr. Speaker. Our Ontario Clean Energy Benefit brought down uh, 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 costs by 10 percent for ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. Our Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit. Saving individuals $963 a year. Mr. Speaker, we understand that times are tough. We understand that a spike in energy costs when it comes to natural gas is challenging, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, we have to let the Ontario Energy Board do their work. They're an independent like agency of the government, order, Mr. Please. Speaker, and that needs to be respected. Absolutely. Thank you. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.